All right, I, I think we're officially recording. And I, is this, uh, are, are, is that uh, Lena Horn over there? Or is yes. that, oh, is that Lady Gaga I'm talking to? Yes, it's, yes, it's Elizabeth Moss. It's so nice to meet you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Allie Stroker. <laughs> and, and I'm, I'm, no, I'm Allie Stroker. Uh, my name is Allie Stroker. No, I am the luckiest dad in the world. I am the dad of, of none other than the Superman of the world, Superwoman, the great Allie Stroker. And we are here at Hawes School, our favorite school in Ridgewood, right? I love Hawes. Hawes is the best. Yeah. Hawes is, um, and, and actually when I grew up, um, there really was no Hawes school. Hawes school. And so it was built after the 70s. But down at that baseball field down there, I lived down there. And <laughs> that's where, you know, I played all my little league baseball and have such fond memories. But I want to tell you something. Hawes school is filled with the greatest teachers, principal, and support personnel that, that I, that, man, I, I think they win best school, so. no, well, we love Haas. We love Haas. So this is not about me, it's about you. And we're so grateful to be able to deliver, you know, this, this, I guess, just story about one person and, you know, the cool part, and then Ali, you can take over, is that, you know, just like every kid that's in that class today, you know, you were in Ridgewood, you know, at age six, seven, eight, nine in an elementary school, actually all the way up to age 10. And so you were where they're at. And, and they're in such a unique, atypical situation right now with COVID-19, with a lot of the social unrest, with, you know, I mean, it's just a turbulent time, but you were in your own turbulent time. So give us a little bit of your background first before we get into the questions that have been thrown out for you. Okay, so first of all, thank you so much for letting us come and speak to you, uh, even if it is virtually. Uh, I, I feel connected to all of you because I was a kid growing up in Ridgewood as well. And I went to Ridge Elementary and a little bit about my story. I was in a car accident when I was two and I got injured and now I use a wheelchair and I've used a wheelchair since I was two years old. And being in elementary school and having a disability and feeling different sometimes was really scary and sometimes was really hard. But I had such great teachers and I had such great friends and it was the people who I was surrounded by that made my experience in elementary school so special and so good. It was also um, the time that I uh, was introduced to musical theater and singing and acting. And that really changed my life too because I dove in headfirst to all the theater that I could be involved with. I did Somerville Children's Theater and I took voice lessons and um, it was just the beginning of my passion and now musical theater is my career. Yeah, so, you know, Ali, Ali and I speak quite a bit and one of the, one of the uh, tentacles, one of the, the base fundamental messages that, that we love to uh, send and it's so, it's so simple, but really it came from the great Jack Canfield. And, and that is a little equation. And the equation is one that, you know, it, it's so cool because it, it relates to everyone every day, no matter where you are. And, and what is that again, Allie? First test question. Okay, so the equation is E plus R equals O. Is that right, Dad? Yeah, so E, what, what do you mean E? What's that mean? So E are the events, the events of our lives, plus the response 
equals the outcome. And well, 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 the well, reason- some events, some events you can't control, right? Like COVID-19 or, or like the fact that winter's here, we might have to quarantine inside. You can't control that, right? Correct. You can't always control the events of your life, but you do have a hundred percent control over your response. And that is the really fun part because in really, really tough situations, you can choose to respond positively. You can choose to respond negatively. You can choose to respond um, with hope and supporting other people. And then you get to see that you do have control over the outcome. Yeah, but, over... but, 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 no, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. When, when something bad happens, it's bad. I mean, if it's a bad weather or bad traffic or a bad homework assignment, isn't that just bad? Yeah, sometimes it's just bad, but you don't have to respond badly. You can choose to have a good attitude. You can choose to make something really difficult into some kind of game. You can um, decide that you are going to work really, really hard and then reward yourself at the end, whatever that looks like. So these are all examples of how you have a choice when it comes to your response. You don't have to respond negatively to something that's happening in your life that is really difficult. So I can control the O, the outcome? I mean, wait a minute, wait a minute, time out, time out. E plus R equal O. I mean, if I choose the O, then that will really dictate what the R is, or this is getting a little tricky, isn't it? Yeah, so, it's a little bit confusing because I have never I was never good at math. Yeah, but but you're a great example. The event, you get paralyzed. The outcome, you win a Tony. Well, wait a minute, that's impossible. You win a Tony. So what does that mean, that you control the R? Absolutely. Okay. You, always, you always can control the response. So, you know, I, I, I was determined and I was focused and I was passionate about the things that I loved and I worked really hard and I didn't give up. And then it led me to a really positive outcome because I worked really, really hard and I had a good attitude. And it didn't mean that there weren't really, really difficult parts to, to um, you know, when, when things got really, really difficult, sometimes it felt like, gosh, is this worth it? Is this, is this what I really, this is not feeling good right now. Is this really where I want to put my time? But I think what was so important for me to see is that not giving up led me to the things that I really, really, really wanted. Okay, so let's give a test question to all the students at Hawes that are watching this. Okay. okay, question number one. The events in your life are under your control. True or false? Come on, kids. The events in your life are under your control. True or false? Well, the answer is, Allie. False. It's a, tr it's a trick question, right? Because sometimes I do control the events, right? Like we're doing a Zoom call. We control this. But all of a sudden, if the internet goes out, I can't control that, right? So yeah. sometimes it's true, sometimes it's false. But here's another trick question. The R in your life is totally out of your control. False. <laughs> All right. So, so that's, so, and the O, is that in your control? 50%. Yeah, that's great. I just love that. And you know, we could go over and over this until we, until we fall off the screen, but it's really important. So that's number that's one. Right. And then before we get to the questions, the other base, like we lived on this. When I look at this screen alley, it's split in half. Like there is a line down the middle and up top is a nice little space. So after you were injured, quite frankly, we were all in panic. We were all really, really shocked and uncertain of the future. 
And then all of a sudden we realized there were some things that were what, Allie? And some things that were what, Allie? <laughs> some things that were in our control and some things that we were out of our control. Right. And Allie, there were some things that you could do and some things that you couldn't do. Couldn't do. And some things that were up to you and things that were not up to you. So we realized that you no longer could do what? I could no longer walk. Right. And what else couldn't you do right in your face? Um, I couldn't play soccer. Right. I couldn't climb on a jungle gym. I right. couldn't uh, climb the rock wall. <laughs> right. So just like COVID-19, all of a sudden, we're put on these restrictions. This is what you can do. This is what you can't do. What you can't do is go to school without a mask on. What you can't do is get together with a large group of people and not be socially distant and hang out. This is what you can't do. And Allie, we could have, and you, we could have whined moaned, groaned, and made all kinds of excuses and blame. But instead, we chose to, fit, to focus it on what? On what I could do. Which was what? And I could sing, I could act, I could dance, I could um, go to school, I could... Um, go to uh, birthday parties. I could um, go watch you coach basketball. I could go shopping at the mall. I could. <laughs> and the more we did things we could do, do how did we feel? Great. And so the more good. we thought about the crap that we couldn't do, how did we feel? Not good. So I love this little quote. Fear can't catch a moving target. We, we, were, we were off and going towards all these amazing things that we could do. And lo and behold, maybe it actually became better because there weren't so many choices and you could get really good at the things you could do. And so that's yeah, what I think you did, right? Yeah, absolutely. That was, that was our strategy. That was it. And then we, we use the GO, we use the GO um, acronym. Go, get up and go, get up and go, do this, go, go, go. And what was the G-O, Allie? This is a trick question. What's the G? I don't know if I know the GO. Okay. The, the GO, go the is go give, give, well, optimism? <laughs> well, I think G is gratitude. Ah. I think gratitude, if you're angry, sad, mad, or doubtful, just get grateful. They'll all just melt like the wicked witch of the West. And mm -hmm. what O is optimism, is really believing there's something good coming around the corner. So mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm talking. I, I, no, 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 no. I always believe this. I always believe that it's so easy to look at what we don't have. But if you are able to write down the list of the things you do have and the things you're grateful for in a moment, you feel different. You feel better. And I, I keep saying through all of this that we're going through right now that things are going to be okay. And then it might be kind of hard and tricky and weird right now, but it's not forever. This isn't forever. And so to remember that, it's hard when you have been under certain circumstances for a few months, it's hard to think, okay, this is just what it is forever. Yeah. But things are gonna change. The only thing constant in life is change. Right. So things are gonna change for sure. You can, you can guarantee things will change. Absolutely. And you know, there's three people in Ridgewood who have a, is it Willapikia? Will it be? With, Wikipedia. That's what I said. That's what I said. That's what Wikipedia. I said. Will, will it be? There's three people in Ridgewood. Uh, the great author, Arlen Coben, 
uh, the great football player, Jeff Fiegels, and Ali Stroker. So you mean to tell me the worst day of our life, which was, I think, at the time, October 30th, 1989, and somehow could have ended up the greatest day of our life? Can things that we look at as really difficult, like maybe having to go through COVID-19, having to quarantine, having to go through the social unrest that we see on the perimeter. Could these someday, could we look back and think that maybe, just maybe, they became turning points in our lives that really turned out to be a great thing? Like, can that happen sometimes? I think it can. I think it really can. Sometimes huge challenges redirect our focus. They make us more grateful. They connect us to our true friends and, and, our, and our real loved ones. And sometimes some of the just busyness that we get caught up in, um, you know, it, it brings us down like kind of a path that you're not meant for. And, and sometimes these moments of when things get a little quieter and a little simpler, you start to see what really matters. What do I really care about? What do I really want to do? Who do I really want to stay in touch with? Who do I actually want to connect with? Yeah, I love it. Well, listen, yeah, let's, yeah. let's swing into the questions because yeah, this, we've got great stuff for you. So first from um, Mrs. Silverstein or Mr. I'm not so sure. Oh no, that's, that's, that's the principal of the school. Coach is the greatest <laughs> principal in all of, in the principal world. What gives you the strength to, what gives you the strength to overcome your challenges? The strength that I have to overcome my challenges comes from a belief in myself. Mm. And that I think comes from being in really difficult situations, sometimes failing, sometimes succeeding, but trusting myself in those difficult situations, no matter the outcome, that I can handle anything, that I'm not handed anything I can't handle. And even if I don't have the answer right away, or I haven't figured something out right away, part of the journey in life is the process. And I think that that's really important to be in process, to know that sometimes it's gonna be messy, sometimes you don't have all the right answers, sometimes you don't even know what to say, but to continue to trust yourself and ask questions and collaborate with other people. Cause that's the other, I think one of the sort of great things for me about solving and being in challenges is that I don't have to do it alone, that I always have community, that I always have friends, that I have my partner. Yeah, I love that. You know, the big, the big term, and I know maybe they talk about it at Hawes is self-efficacy. And mm -hmm. self-efficacy is really an internal belief that somehow you'll find your way through this puzzle. And at the end, it's, it's also linked to optimism, but it's a confidence that, you know, I've, I've been through tough things before, even like, you know, losing my keys, which you do so frequently, or, you know, or, 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 or turning down the wrong direction. I'm going to, I'll work my way there. It's just the belief you can do it. And I, I've watched you. I think internally, you've always said and coached other people, look, you'll find a way. You might, might not feel like it, but this pain and challenge will pass and you're going to find a place. You really will. So I love that. So the next question comes from uh, the Mrs. Raup. It says, what's the biggest challenge you've ever faced? Hmm, great question. The biggest challenge I've ever faced I guess you know, I think this is sort of a an interesting answer because I think people assume that it's my disability, but because I've been in a wheelchair my whole life, it doesn't really feel like a challenge. It just feels like my life and just 
part of the challenges that come along with my life. So I guess the biggest challenge I ever went through was after I graduated college and I was hoping to really begin my acting career and nothing was happening. And I couldn't get an audition, I couldn't get a job, and I felt so defeated because all I wanted was to be a professional actress and singer. And so sticking that out, I moved to LA, I auditioned and I auditioned and I auditioned and I heard nothing. And then finally, after a few years, not giving up, little doors started to open. And that's when um, I did Spelling Bee at Paper Mill Playhouse. That's when I did The Glee Project. And those were sort of the beginnings of things happening for me professionally. But um, it was really, really hard because I felt like I was not being heard and I felt like I wasn't being seen. And that was painful and really, really scary. And I didn't know, you know, is this going to work out? Was this a mistake? Should I not have done this? But I didn't give up because I really, 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 really wanted it. I really wanted it more than anything. So that, again, in, in, in the elementary school, we teach grit resilience and willpower and you know it is just what you said i mean every performer that you've been around has had to go through this period where they felt like giving up but the passion for what they did kept them going and the mornings mm -hmm. they got up and said i gotta keep i gotta keep going you know as the great angela duckworth said she said if i had to put one tattoo on my forearm, it would be fall down nine times, get up 10. Mm -hmm. So it's just that ability to keep going. And as they say, Allie, tough times never last, but tough people do. And mm -hmm. showing that grit, it's not easy, is it? But it, it's probably, you know, one of the key things to becoming successful. Okay, next question comes from Mrs. Acosta. How do you temper your feelings of doubt when you face a challenge? So you're feeling doubtful, you're feeling afraid. How do you temper them uh, when those challenges come? I think it's sort of just like a healthy balance of what you're telling yourself, right? You know, it's okay if you have doubt about whether something will work out, but that also needs to be paired with belief yeah. that it will. You know, so, um, you know, doubt and, and nerves are kind of a part of taking risks. And I really believe, you know, taking risks is part of what makes life beautiful and special and, and exciting. And so, um, you know, if you are doubtful, that's okay, you know, but also, believing in yourself, believing in whatever you're pursuing um, is equally as important. Yeah. So, you know, and again, I love to reference things that I, I know are being taught, like Joseph Campbell talked about the hero's journey in a man with a thousand uh, faces, his monomyth, that, you know, all of these, all of these great things that we want to go into carry with them fear. And if they weren't great, we wouldn't be fearful. And so on the other side of fear is everything we want, but we have to be willing to march in with fear and shake and shiver and, and be scared, but just keep rolling forward into those dark caves. And that's where the gold really is. You know, as Campbell said, in the dark cave, we fear to enter. There lies the hidden treasure we see. So it's going to be there. Our, that doubt is just kind of like, it's what makes it, makes it special, right? Yeah. All right. So last question for Mrs. Mrs. Acosta, what goals do you have for your future? I love that question. Well, um, I would love to create um, a TV show. Um, and I would love to buy a home one day. Um, these are long-term sort of goals. I'd love to have a family. Um, and I also think that I try to also stay present because life changes really quickly and sometimes things are relevant and sometimes they're not. Um, and so 
I kind of, that list is always sort of changing depending on what I'm inspired to do. And um, I know I want to continue creating really cool art and, and content for people. And um, I want to be on stage again. And then I also really want, you know, it's not, it's not the sim simple things, but it's the, you know, some of the things that I have always looked forward to as milestones in my life, like having a family, like having, owning a home. Right. So let me unpack or double click on one of the little statements you made. You know, we all have goals, but when, when things are uncertain, you know, during COVID-19, we don't know where we're going to be three months from now. We don't know what's going to happen. You said it's also crucial to stay present because mm -hmm. the only thing that really is in your control is the, and I'm going to use a, a funny flip on words, the pleasant moment not the right. present moment. And <laughs> like you can that. make today, you know, you know you can make today good. And mm -hmm. what's gonna happen three months from now? So we have to constantly blend a, 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 a North Star of where we wanna go with back to what we can do today to maybe give us the best chance of one day getting that. Exactly, exactly. Beautiful. All right, so next question says, Mrs. Rhoda's class, and by the way, um, I, I, I taught um, her great, her family, amazing family, but how do, you how, do, how do you learn to move in your wheelchair so you can dance? Wait a minute, you can't, you're in a wheelchair, you can't dance. How do you dance? Okay, well, I love to dance, and uh, I love this question, so I use my upper body, and I dance with my arms, I dance with my neck, I dance with my head, I dance with my um, hair, I um, move my wheelchair so I can do spins and move forward and back and wheelies. And basically it's just like a whole different, I like to call it my physical vocabulary. So I move and have a physical vocabulary based on my abilities. And uh, there are a lot of wheelchair dance teams out there and dance companies and moving on wheels is really beautiful because it's kind of like moving on ice. I love it. And so isn't this alley during this COVID period, like one of the most important uh, virtues that you can work on and resources that you can pull from inside is that MSU Resource, resource, that great MSU that 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 really is needed, and you live with MSU, and you're really good at what, Allie? MSU stands for Make Stuff Up, and this is actually the university that my dad went to, <laughs> um, the University of Making Stuff Up, and um, and it's just a fun little little kind of like thing to remember because you know there is there there you know we think about in school there's one answer there's a there's a correct answer but in life that's a little bit different in life there's a lot of answers and in life there's there's not usually one way of doing something so i have always liked the the philosophy of making stuff up and knowing that there can be a lot of answers to one question yeah, we always took great pride in being kooky and zany and freaky and weird and different and not like anyone else because we weren't. And it really is a great, you know, motto to fight through this COVID-19. Ali, um, how old were you when you got your wheelchair? I think we mentioned I, this. My first wheelchair I got when I was two after I was injured and it was a little red wheelchair and it was really cool. How did you feel after you got the Tony Award? I felt so amazing and it felt like such a beautiful um, celebration and um, a moment where the theater community, which is a community I feel a part of, but I've always wanted to be accepted in, was saying, Allie, we celebrate you, we honor you, we respect what you do. And there's no greater feeling than feeling respected. So they say that great players, tonight we're going to watch the Giants against the great Tom Brady. Uh, these great players seem to come through 
in the really most difficult times. And you've had a lot of performances. You've, you've been on stage hundreds of times, but I think maybe one of your greatest all time, if not the greatest all time performance was when you rolled out onto the Tony stage and without a script, you said a few things there that touched a lot, a lot of people. And I think are, it was the difference maker and has made the brand of who you are uh, clear to everyone. And do you remember what you said? Because I know it by heart. No, I do not know it by heart. <laughs> well, you said this award is for every every person watch. I think you said person rather than child. Person watching tonight who has in a disability, a limitation, or a challenge that has been waiting. They've been waiting to see themselves represented in this arena. This award's for you right here. And so you were making a statement that I think, and, and you, can, you can carry it. The statement meant what? The statement meant that it was not just an award for me. It was an award for every young person watching who had never seen anybody with a disability in this arena. Um, and it was, it was a moment and sort of a call to action to all of them that you can do anything. And that we do in my community of people with disabilities belongs here in the theater community. And um, to keep dreaming and to keep pursuing your goals and, um, you know, it's, it was, it was also just an acknowledgement of my community, not just me, to be represented in, in that arena. Yeah, and, you can, and you've mentioned this so many times before, when you grew up and went to Broadway shows, there never was an actor or actress who was truly in a chair. And mm -hmm. for you to put a symbol, an emblem up that says you can, I think touched a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a great, a great one. Now we're going to rapid fire these questions a little bit just for time purposes, Allie. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because we're okay. So this, we're going to move over to um, Mrs. Barry's class. And she says, since you're in a wheelchair throughout, how do you do everyday stuff? Like great question. Like get out of bed. I, yeah. Well, I am, have a very strong upper body and my arms and I can transfer from my wheelchair into my bed, into my car and into the shower. And I use my upper body to do that, my, my arms. And, um, and then, you know, other little things like cooking. Um, I, I do it all by sitting in my wheelchair. And sometimes I have to pull up sideways to say the counter, to brush my teeth, or um, to um, do the dishes. I roll up sideways. Um, but I figured out all different ways to do the things that you do every day. And I, I'll, just, I'll just hashtag that a touch. You're, you know, I, I always love to tell a story. By the time you get out in your car, you've transferred in your wheelchair, out of your wheelchair, maybe eight times. Mm -hmm. And we can, you know, we can, so, but, but you always seem to do it when things get tough. I see you use a magic secret. When, when things get a little bit frustrating, there's a magic secret that you use. Can you tell the group what you do? I don't know which one you're talking about. You sing. <laughs> Oh, yes, always. <laughs> I'm always singing. When things get crappy, you sing, which is amazing, yeah. right? Yes, so. I always am singing, yeah, or hum. Um, uh, what was going on in your mind before you won the Tony Award? I was pretty nervous because I performed right before it as well. So that, that day was so fun and full of a lot of nerves as well. Yeah. Were you ever denied a role because you were in a wheelchair? Um, 
I think so. I don't really give much attention to that, you know, um, of rejection, just because it's a huge part of my career. You know, there's probably more rejection than there is, you know, getting roles. So I don't usually hold on to those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, how did you become one of the best dancers, actresses, while struggling with being in a wheelchair? How did you become one of the best at this? Like, like, how can you sing? You, 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 you have no feeling from the chest down. How do you connect with your diaphragm? Uh, all those things I did because I wanted to. <laughs> Um, there was just a real desire to do it. And so um, in many ways, pursuing theater and acting and singing and, and um, dancing was what I needed in order to get through the challenges of being in a chair. I needed something, another challenge yeah. to take my attention off of one challenge. Yeah. And, you know, I figured it out along the way. You know, it's like every day you have to kind of figure it out. There's no right or wrong. Yeah. And I love that beautiful blend you have. You're so calm and kind and loving and soft and empathetic and giving and generous. And then bang, here comes the lion. Here comes the tigress. Here comes the most tenacious, fierce, fiery woman around so how do you blend the two and trigger and push the button like uh oh no 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 you're you're dealing with the wrong gal here and then come <laughs> back into this kindness how do you do that hmm. how do you do that well you you learn what you know you learn what kind of energy and will you need for different situations yeah Right. So, you know, if you're with, you know, if I'm working with somebody who's younger than I am, you know, you can feel that they need patience and yeah. encouragement and love. But if I am in a situation where I have to be a leader, sometimes um, I will bring more energy, more um, direction, more yeah. uh, power. But also, I think that those situations cause for generosity and and listening and so it just depends on every situation you're in and and the more you are exposed to different kinds of situations the more you get to know yourself yeah. so one of my things that I always told myself when I went off to college is say yes to everything say yes to every experience because you never know what you're going to learn about yourself in those experiences yeah. I, I love, we had a quick talk the other day about alter egos and you know, mm -hmm. you bring a different you in different situations. It's right. the same you, but you know, it's kind of interesting that, that you have to become a different alley when you're performing. Right. Right. All right, let's finish it up. Uh, how did your experience in Ridgewood prepare you for the challenges you faced? Well, Ridgewood was the most amazing, beautiful, encouraging, supportive community. Um, I just had such a such a great childhood, and the people that I was surrounded by were so special and so supportive. And so, um, I think in many ways, you know, nothing fully prepares you right for when you leave home. But I think knowing that I had that support system and knowing that I still have that support system in Ridgewood forever makes you feel more confident and, um, and, and knowing that when you take a risk and if you fail, you still have a whole army of people behind you that support you. And that's, that's kind of what the gift of Ridgewood has been for me in the past 15 years since I left home. Yeah. And I think you and I would, would really mesh together on this and say, there's a lot of important qualities that you can develop. And when you're younger, it's a lot of the times all about you and you're worried mm -hmm. about if you're happy and whether you can go out during the quarantine and whether you, but the greatest quality that you've developed, I've seen it in action and you never, 
you never lose it, is that quality of kindness and love for other people and reaching out to care for others. Even when there's times when you felt not good about yourself, you did that. And I think that you and I would both agree that a giant part of the success you've mustered is from, is from the, the, the support and love you've gotten from others. And they do that for you, Allie, because you do it for them. So yeah. what would you say to all the young people at Hawes about really making an effort to be kind to others and reach out? Well, if you are kind and loving to others, that's what you will then receive. What you give is what you receive. And so even as a young person in elementary school, to start today with treating people with respect and love and kindness, because that's then what you will receive in your life. And um, if you practice now, it's something that'll be automatic when you go to middle school and when you go to high school and then when you go to college and then when you go out into the real world, being kind to people and being respectful and, um, and loving is, is really, I think, the, the foundation of, of happiness, which, you know, we've talked about career and, and challenges today, but, you know, when you think about the big picture, like it's, it's about being, being happy and content with your life and being satisfied. And I think that comes with how you treat others. Okay. So last one. So it's 35 to seven. We're losing at halftime. We're, 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 we're getting killed. We're, 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 the game's over. There's no way we'll win. This is terrible. Everybody's moaning. They're, they're straggling into the locker room. They sit there with their heads down, and they're like, all of a sudden, Ali Stroker wheels up a little closer to that team and says, let me see those eyes for a minute. And Ali, would you deliver your best halftime speech to anybody that's feeling a little bit down in the dumps? I would say, um, <laughs> okay. I would say you can do it. You can do it. This is, um, Dad, this is the question for you. You're a coach. Why? You're the halftime coach. No. I mean, but I mean, it would just be, it would just be like. Just don't you know, give up and don't. Well, the moment you hit the wall is the moment to see that you can push beyond it, right? Yeah. And so, and so to not give up. And, you know, I think, I think more specifically, I can speak on like right now, right now in our lives, right? Like things are starting to feel like, okay, like um, what are the next six months going to be like? Like, what is this going to be? Like the last six months have been really hard. And I think it's so important to take things day to day, yeah. you know, to not worry about six months from now. Everything's going to be okay. But just worry about day to day. How are you doing today? How are you doing this afternoon? How are you doing tonight? You know, those are, I think that, I think that that is important right now to be really present. And that's it. That's the halftime speech. Yeah. Stop looking at the scoreboard. Yep. Go out and play one play at a time. One play, yeah. do the best you can for one play, and then yeah. another play, and then another play. Right. And someday there'll be an end, and you may just come back and do something that seems impossible. Exactly. Allie, this is always the greatest thing in the world for me. I, you know, we're not in person at Hawes, but I feel Hawes, don't you? Totally. That's I can feel those so fun about this. Yeah. So. Well, we love you guys. Thank you so much, Allie. Thank Have a you. great school year. Thank you guys so much. All right, All right. Dad. All right. Okay. Let me just okay. try to shut this off.